I want to start off by saying we've all done some pretty stupid things in our lives, some more than others. The true story that I'm about to tell you is one of the stupidest things I have ever done and is something I've since regretted. However, it has also taught me a very valuable lesson. I've only told a couple of my good friends this story and I've been contemplating posting this for a while now. So here I go. For those who don't know what Grindr is, it's a phone application for gay and bisexual men to create a profile consisting of a photo of them with certain qualities listed such as age, weight, ethnicity, and height. And you can include a header and body of text saying whatever you want, mainly what you're looking for or a short summary describing yourself. This app is used for other gay and bisexual men for hookups, dates, or friends or chatting if you don't want to meet any of the guys. It uses your location to determine how far away any other guy who uses the app is. A couple of years ago, I was at school sitting in class. Class was almost over, so we were messing around waiting for the professor to dismiss us. I decided to open up Grindr to check and see if I had any messages. I had one from a guy who was a few miles away while at least half of the photos are headless torsos, i.e. photos cropped below the neck to show the chest and abdomen and not the face. This guy's photo was of him from the chest up. The photo was a bit blurry and he was wearing a plaid shirt and a hat that was pulled to the side. He was a thin looking guy, had some scruff and grayish blue eyes and was standing in a living room with a fireplace behind him and various knickknacks on the fireplace altar. He's cute, I thought. The message started off with a simple, hey, or something of the sort. Nothing that really started off any kind of conversation. I normally messed around with the guys on this app, not taking it very seriously, or just having casual conversations with guys who messaged me. I was feeling especially horny today though, and even though I'm not really one for hooking up, I thought that maybe today would be different and I could get some action in between classes. I had a good four hours to kill. Why not have some fun? So we talked for a little bit, him mostly coaxing me to come over. He would send me some explicit photos to coax me further and after I rejected the invitation a few times, I finally gathered the courage to meet up with him, mostly overtaken by my horniness. So I asked for his address, and once he sent it to me, I left class early and headed out to his place. Mistake number one. I arrived at his duplex, which sat in a quiet neighborhood located off the highway. I walked up to the front door and rang the doorbell and knocked, and also texted him that I was at his doorstep. Nobody opened the door, so I awaited his response, which came a few minutes later. He said, just so you know, I'm by discreet. I replied, that's okay, I don't care. He says, okay, the door is unlocked. I'm in the bedroom to the left at the top of the stairs. When you reach the top of the stairs, take your clothes off and come inside. By the last text, you would think red flags would be going off by now, considering that he didn't greet me at the front door and is giving me directions on what to do in order to hook up with him but I guess my horniness had dumped me way down because I obliged and walked into his house. Mistake number two. The house was dark, only lit by sunlight. It was quiet too, and I got a bad feeling in my gut. Nothing strong, but something just felt off. Right in front of the door was the staircase, and to the left of the staircase was the living room, and further back was the kitchen, Note, at this point, I didn't think of seeing if the living room in the duplex matched the living room in the photo he had used as his grinder profile picture. So, I walked up the stairs, and as I neared the top, I heard noises coming from one of the bedrooms. Once I reached the top and listened for a bit, I realized that the noises were sounds of porn blasting from the speakers of a computer that sat somewhere in the upstairs area. I opened up the door to the right of the staircase, even though he told me that he would be in the bedroom to the left of the top of the stairs. 
Inside the room to the right was a clean, empty bedroom, and I realized that that was where the porn sounds were coming from. I'm over here, said a voice from behind me. I turned around to face the door to the left at the top of the stairs, which was cracked just a smidgen and appeared to be dark inside. I'll be honest with you, I have no clue what I was thinking when I did this, but here is where mistake number three comes in. I got undressed and left my clothes and shoes at the top of the stairs. I opened the door and walked in, leaving the door open. I couldn't see anything. It was completely pitch black inside the room, except for a slither of light that was escaping from what looked like a blanket or a curtain covering up a window. Not even enough light from the upstairs area could light up the room. It was like a void of darkness. I told you I was going to be in this room, he said. His voice sounded a bit nasally and higher pitched than I imagined it would have sounded, judging by the photo he had set as his grinder photo. I know, I just heard some noises from another room and figured you would be in there for some reason, I replied. That's okay, come on in, shut the door. I'm in the bed in front of you. Can I turn on the lights? Why? So I can see your face. You've seen it already, though. I know, but I can't see anything right now, and I just want to make sure your face matches the photo you had on Grinder. Why are you worrying about that? Just come into bed. That's when my gut instinct finally won over my horniness, and I suddenly became very paranoid. Why wouldn't this guy let me turn on the lights? What was the big deal? Can I just turn on the lights? I asked. I'm sure he could tell I was feeling uncomfortable, but he replied, Why? Why don't we mess around for a little bit, and then we can turn on the lights? No, I want to turn the lights on now. This is weird. I don't see what the big deal is. You've seen what I look like. Just come to bed. I stood there naked, staring into darkness. I don't know who was in it, lying in the bed waiting for me to get in there with him, but my brain was screaming at me to get out. I've never been this scared before, but this was the first time I was feeling it. I honestly didn't know what to do, except for just stand there. Finally, I found the strength to move and to speak and said, Nah, man, this is really sketchy. I stood there a moment longer, staring at where I assumed the guy was before I turned around and walked out of the room. I left the door open only a crack and threw on my shirt. I started to get my underwear ready to put back on when I heard the sound of the mattress compressing as if the guy was getting out of the bed. That's when I booked it out of there, fearing that he was getting out of bed to snatch me from the top of the stairs and pull me inside the bedroom. Going commando, I yanked my pants up and ran down the stairs and out of the duplex with my underwear, socks and shoes in my arms, and attempted to keep my pants up because I didn't buckle my belt. If anyone saw me running out of the duplex like that, I don't care what they thought. I jumped in my car and sped out of there as fast as I could. As I drove back to my school, I received a text from the guy. All he sent was a photo. It was the same photo he had set as his grinder picture. I responded back, telling him that he'd shown me that photo before, but I needed more proof to show that it was really him and not some photo he found online or stolen from someone else. I never heard from him after that. To this day, that was still one of the scariest things that ever happened to me. I continue to think about what would have happened if I ended up crawling into bed with that guy. Who knows, it could have been a regular hookup where we would have sex and I would go back to my daily business. Or he could have been completely different than the guy in the photo. Or he could have murdered me, I don't know. It just felt like a nightmare. One of those nightmares where it's so dark that you can barely see anything. I couldn't even believe that it was really happening. And now I can't believe that I actually did something like that and went as far as walking into a stranger's home, getting naked before walking into a pitch black bedroom 
with some freak whom I still to this day do not know what he looks like. It's one of the stupidest things I've ever done, and because of it, I know that I will never do something like that again. I feel embarrassed for it, but sometimes we do pretty stupid things, and being young, we don't really think anything bad could happen. We think we're invincible. And that, everybody, is why I don't use Grindr anymore. Online dating can be pretty scary, but people can be even scarier. This happened two days ago. I live in a small city in Romania, around 30,000 inhabitants. Romania isn't exactly known for their tolerance of gay people. It's not as bad as other places such as Russia, but the situation is definitely not rosy here either. I get on Grinder and meet a guy, 18 years old apparently. The guy didn't have a picture of his face as his profile picture because it's too dangerous. He had a picture of a rose drawing. Most guys on Grinder here don't have pictures of themselves. We talk for a bit, and I really liked the guy, and then we finally accept to exchange face pictures. I send him a selfie of myself, and he sends me a picture of a guy from our city. He was cute, and I really, really liked him. So I told him, hey, I saw you around the city, didn't know you were gay too, smiley face. We talked, and finally arranged to meet. I had some errands to run at the tailor shop, my cousin's bachelorette party is coming next week, and I had to adjust my favorite shirt, so I ask him to meet me in front of the tailor shop. The building in which the shop is located has four stories. The ground floor is a clothes shop, which my aunt works at. The first floor is a storage room. The third floor is a barber's salon, and the fourth floor was the tailor. So I go to the tailor shop, and then go to the clothes shop on the ground floor to visit my aunt and see how she's doing. As I was looking out the window of the clothes shop, I noticed there were five men, all of them in their late twenties behind the building. None of them was the guy I got a picture of, and none of them even looked remotely close to what the guy looked like. I text the guy I was supposed to meet and asked him if he made it to the tailor shop. As soon as I send the message, one of the five guys' phones lit up, and he started texting. As soon as he stopped texting, I got a notification from Grinder. I'm behind the tailor shop. I went there to smoke so no one would see me. Come smoke with me. I was terrified as I realized I wasn't going to meet the guy in the picture. He tries to get me to go behind the tailor shop and I try to get him to the side of it. There were no windows to the side of the building, so after a few tries, he agreed to meet me at the side of the tailor shop. All five guys went to the side. I peeked my head from the door, looked left and right, and as soon as I saw my way was clear, I ran for it. Grinder cutie, let's not meet. Update. I bumped into the actual cute guy the next day and started talking to him. I opened my phone and pretended to use it, and I went on Grinder. I saw him look at my screen and ask me, you're you know. I said yes, because I actually knew he was gay too, because a friend we had in common told me, and he says, me too. I told him about the incident, and he got kind of scared, because the guys used his picture. He asked me what the name of the profile was, then looked on his grinder, and noticed that he had also talked to them. He gave them a face pic, and they arranged to meet, but something came up and he couldn't make it. He was obviously very glad. They sent him a picture of another guy I know. I notified him too. On a more positive note, he then agreed to go out with me. This was started in January of 2019. For some background context, I'm a young gay man living in a very populated city, so weird things are bound to happen, especially when using the gay dating app Grindr. 
I'm sure you've all heard of it. When this started, I was living in a biggish city in northern Florida, but had plans to move the next week. My two friends had come down to celebrate my moving away and also one of their birthdays. We hung out in my city for a day and then drove to Miami together. It was a lot of fun for the most part, but this story begins on the last day of my vacationing there. We were at a brunch place preparing to say goodbye to the city and drive back home so that I could pack my things and relocate to where I live now. And I received a notification from Grinder, saying that I had received a new message. I opened it up and the message simply said hi. It was from a blank profile and it said it was sent using a feature called explore, meaning the person wasn't local to Miami but lived elsewhere. I replied not minding the faceless profile because a lot of men on the app are not open with their sexuality and might not want to take the risk of people in their actual life finding out about them. We make small talk, exchange names and such, and he seemed like a really nice person. He eventually sent me a picture of him and he was very attractive looking. He asked me for my number. And I was so flustered by Miami and saying goodbye to our temporary friends that I just gave it to him without thinking about what could come of it. And I regret this dearly. We messaged each other over the next few days and things seemed pretty normal. We talked a lot, just casual chit chat, asking about careers, goals, etc. Nothing strange. And then I noticed a notification from the cash app that I had received $100 from a random username I didn't recognize. The memo was an eggplant emoji, gross. And I was so confused I started texting my friends, telling them how a random person had just accidentally sent me 100 bucks, and how he'd have to keep sending me more in order to ask me to return it, because you can only communicate with someone on the app if it's included in a payment. We got a laugh out of this and I decided to just return the money because I would be really upset if I was on the other end of the equation and had just sent a gracious amount of money to someone random by accident. Before I was able to do that though, my new grinder friend texted me and said, don't ask me for any more. That's all I can give you. I will block you if you ask me to send you more. I was so confused. I never asked this man for money. I have no idea how he even got my cash app username. I know you can look people up using their phone numbers, but I hadn't even linked my new phone number to the app yet. I replied, asking him how he got my information, but he wouldn't say anything about it. I guess I just dropped it because free money, and I'm an idiot for that. Time goes on and things are getting a little weird between our messages. He begins asking me to send him pictures of my feet, which in of itself isn't weird. I don't like to kink shame, but something just felt very off about him at this point. It's as if I were talking to a new person. I tell him that he needs to calm down a bit and that this was getting uncomfortable for me, to which he agrees. Time goes by and eventually he insinuates that I should move back to Florida to the city where he was located so that he could take care of me. I firmly decline, to which he says, well then I'll have to come to you. At this point my alarm bells are going off and I'm thinking, I've got to put an end to this. I don't reply right away anymore, and he tells me he's always wanted to come to where I currently live. I didn't even know how he knew that. I didn't give him any of my social media and even if I had there's no way he could have known because I intentionally withheld any information online about me relocating, as I was tired of everyone knowing my business. I've always had my location on Grindr set to off, so he couldn't see where I was or even how many miles away from him. I told him at that point, he needs to leave me alone, and that I didn't wish to talk to him. I didn't block him though, because I was starting to get paranoid and wanted to have a record of the things he would continue to say in case things got weird, which of course they did. First, he told me he was sorry for lying and sent me a few pictures of what he actually looked like. I hate to sound like a jerk, 
but something was seriously off with the way this person looked. Almost every picture had a very big, disturbing and ecstatic smile, and big wide eyes staring directly at the camera, very close up. He was probably in his 30s and looked like he didn't take care of himself very well. His skin was uneven and grey, and he had a short beard that looked like it hadn't been maintained at all. If that makes any sense. One of them looks like it might have just been an accident because his face was blurry, and he was angry and just staring into the camera with a hateful evil expression on his face. He also sent me a picture of his mouth, but only his big smile. Nothing else was in it. There were pictures of his apartment as well. It looked almost empty other than a small table with a photograph of unknown people in it. Also a fire hydrant was there. It was all very weird. I didn't reply to these. And that just resulted in a string of angry texts from him, telling me he wished he'd never met me, and that he hates me. Throughout all of the weird, uncomfortable, and filthy messages he sent me, there are a few exceptionally disturbing things. He sent me a link to his YouTube page, which I did end up viewing, and the videos were just him literally talking to himself and making jokes to himself. There were over 10 videos of them, and I was the first viewer, although they'd been up for months. If that wasn't weird enough, whenever he would pause in between sentences in these videos, I could hear faintly in the background what sounded like someone's muffled screaming. And every so often, after hearing the screaming, I would hear him try to hold back a very high pitched sinister laugh that sounded nothing like him. I could tell from the sound quality that it was something this man was producing and not a bystander. I also don't think he has many friends. Most of the videos have since been deleted, and I don't know why. I write poetry, and at some point he was begging me to send him my poetry. He also sent me a link to his WordPress, which I also viewed, and the poems were somehow actually very well written, like extremely beautiful poems. But I realized that the things he was saying in them made absolutely no sense. I tried analyzing them anyway. I could because I was trying to figure out what was wrong with this guy, and none of them made sense. He would randomly send me small amounts of money on the app, I guess in an attempt to get me to talk to him. Fast forward a little bit. The timeline, bear in mind, is slightly messy because this was just constant stress on me. And I was still receiving messages from him every 10 minutes that I wasn't replying to. These were weird. Here are what some of them said. Did you block me? You want to put me out your life? That's fine. But it's an irreversible decision. When you push me out of your life, you don't get me back. When you feel dumb about it later, and you will. I am the best thing that's happened to you in years. It's a privilege you know me. You want to clear a space out for someone more deserving because you're an upty little so and so? No problem. You're not getting rid of me. Stuff like that. I withheld some of the more vile and descriptive ones because it said what he would do to me, and because I didn't like to read or think about them. He would also reply to his own texts almost instantly and apologize for what he said and told me, please don't go, and things like that. I finally broke down and told one of my best friends about this, who is also gay, but very muscular and protective of me. I don't know. He just makes me feel safe somehow, and I didn't know who else to tell. He immediately got really mad and took my phone and called him. Best friend told him aggressively that he was my boyfriend, which makes no sense because I wouldn't be on Grinder if I had a boyfriend, and that creepy Grinder guy needs to stop reaching out. The Grinder guy is silent and then suddenly starts hysterically laughing and making the most inhumane, awful noise I've ever heard, speaking sentences that were English but with words that didn't make any sense when put together. This creeped us out. The look on my friend's face still gives me chills. He never gets uncomfortable, but he was just staring at me with this blank expression, and it was in this moment I realized that I should have just blocked this man as soon as I realized something was off. I didn't know what to do, I guess. 
After the call, he messaged me a bunch of horrible things and then says sorry. And this is a cycle of about 15 minutes until he sends me this. The private Facebook messages you may see were all written before our conversation via text and phone tonight. So naturally disregard them. I blocked him. I have no idea what he was on about with the Facebook thing. I looked and couldn't find anything. This final exchange happened about a month and a half ago. I thought this was the end until about two weeks ago. I was exploring a nearby large city and there are loads of big cities around me and I'm basically in the middle of them with that same best friend. We're walking out of a museum and I see someone that looked very familiar leaning against a cement wall to the left of the big stairs that was the entry to the museum. He was staring at us, but I couldn't make anything out about it. I ignored it and we hopped on the bus to take us to a nearby restaurant for lunch. It wasn't until we got to the restaurant that I realized who this man was. It was him, the creepy grinder guy. I'm sure of it. I have no idea how he knew where I was, but I knew he traveled over a thousand miles to come to the area I was living in. I didn't mention it to my friend because I'm seriously creeped out, but I think I'm gonna tell him when we hang out again because I don't want anything to happen to him either. Luckily, I'm moving again in a few weeks, this time very, very far away, and I'm considering taking all of this to the police, but I don't really have many options. This has seriously been the most uncomfortable experience of my entire life. So about three years ago when I was 18 or so, I was using Grinder, and someone messaged me. For convenience, this lovely gentleman shall be referred to as Rando. So we started talking, and he asked how I was and what I was up to, the usual conversation starters. Shortly after beginning the conversation, Rando began to sound rather depressing, moaning about his insecurities and how everyone hates him, occasionally talking about how he should just kill himself. So, being the nice person that I am, I try finding something about him that I could compliment on, try to make him feel better, that sort of thing, or bring a smile at least, and that's where things began to get heavy. Rando began deflecting my compliments, calling me a liar or a user, or saying I'm just trying to make fun of him. I tried my best to reassure him that my compliments were genuine because I hate seeing people depressed or down. It's just in my nature to bring joy to people. Now, I have been in his shoes before, with the severe insecurity thing, so I know how he felt. After he finally began to believe that my compliments were real, he began to get very attached to me, started sending me over 20 messages at once, and if I didn't reply within 5 seconds, he'd start to be like, oh, I guess you found someone better to talk to then. You're like all the rest and it began to get frustrating at this point. Now, I could have just blocked him and saved me the headache, but I have anxiety, and I feared that he'd turn up at my door someday and do something drastic if I blocked him. He also tried sending me nudes to grab my attention when I didn't reply literally instantly to his messages, and it got worse and worse from there. Eventually, he told me he'd be in my town over the weekend, and began to get very pushy about meeting up somewhere and doing abject things. When I didn't reply, he flips out and started finding me on different social medias to keep tabs on me, Facebook messages, friend requests, Instagram follows, etc. I went on a night out with some friends of mine at the time, forgetting he was in town over the weekend, and he saw me walking down the street and he ran up to me bawling his eyes out about me trying to avoid him, and he began begging for my phone number and house address and whether he could join us on our night out, and when we politely refused, he followed us further and tried forcing drinks into my hand when we got to the bar. Infuriated by how clingy he was being, I went home just to realize he boarded the same bus as me and followed me back to my place before he finally disappeared. He started messaging me on Grinder about visiting me at home sometime, 
or trying to find my friends to get my phone number. I finally snapped at this point and finally blocked him and I thought that was that, only to discover the next day he was trying to catfish me with my own pictures to try and get my attention and screaming to know why I blocked him. At this point, things got way too heavy and I deleted Grinder from my phone, changed my number and moved house just to avoid him. This whole experience has really put me off dating people with severe insecurities out of fear something like this will occur again and I've been trying to go against my nature to avoid complimenting people too much. Three years later, I haven't seen him since. So Rando, let's not meet. This happened to me around Halloween of 2018. After work, I visited friends and after I went home around 3am-ish, and the bus I take to Burnaby, which is right next to Vancouver, is a long commute, about an hour bus ride. So after five minutes on board, I decided to just check Grinder. After a while, some random guy in his 40s started messaging me with creepy things that he wanted me to come over to which I replied continuously that I wasn't interested. I should also mention this creepy guy was on the bus and wearing a Chucky costume that did not help with the creepy vibe. I was getting annoyed at the dirty messages so blocked him. I also saw a lot of people getting off so I assumed he wasn't on the bus until I hear this creepy voice telling me, don't act like you're full of yourself, come over and we'll have some fun, as he is walking towards my seat. So I proceed to tell him to get lost and then I'm going back home and he needs to stop. I'm coming over if you don't want to come to my place. At this point, there was still about 20 minutes left for the bus ride. My phone battery was close to dying and only drunk girl sitting at the front. So I went and sat close to the driver. Stupid me should have texted the transit police or said something to the driver, but the guy kept staring over and winking at me. When the bus came to a stop, I thought to myself that the nightmare was over. But to my surprise, the creepy guy got off at the same time and asked, So what's the plan, cutie? I tried checking my phone and it was dead. And the bus stop is literally by a golf course in the middle of nowhere. I told the guy to go home and leave me alone. He didn't. He was following me, constantly saying dirty things. And I felt the guy trying to keep with my pace and felt his hand touching my shoulder, to which my response was scream to leave me alone, and threw him a branch and ran as fast as I could until I got home. This was a good scare for the Halloween season, but creepy dude, let's not meet again. Several years ago, I was in Livingstone in Scotland. I was there for just a few days in a hotel with my sister and brother-in-law. Whilst there, I went on a few dating and hookup sites just to see who was in the area. I didn't intend to actually meet up with anyone whilst there as I had put that on my profile. I put on that I was only looking to chat and make friends. On the day before we were due to leave, I went on to one of the hookup apps, Grinder, and I received a message from someone. We got chatting for a while and he was very charming and sweet and such. A hairdresser from Edinburgh. After a while chatting and getting to know each other, I decided to hit the hay. The following morning, I received a message from him asking if I wanted to meet up for some fun in the bedroom. I told him I couldn't as we were leaving that day and it had been stated on my profile that I wasn't meeting anyone whilst in Scotland. He started being abusive, saying I was a time waster, and saying sexual things of what he would have done if we had met, but that I wouldn't have a chance, etc. Most of it was just insults and swears. I told him that if he didn't stop, I would report him and block him. He didn't stop, so I did just that. Fast forward to the last couple of years, 
and the guy I had spoken to was in the news. He had been using the app to lure victims so that he could have sex with them, but tampered with the condoms so that he could purposefully infect them with HIV. He would text message his victim saying, you got the fever and other cryptic things. I thanked the lucky stars that I had decided not to meet anyone. His 10 known victims could very easily have been 11 otherwise. Some people are really disgusting. I can't imagine the hell the victims are going through. With so much stigma still around these days, so many people will assume that they were idiots in the bedroom and not used protection, though that's far from it. This happened about a year ago. I was on Grindr looking for either fun dates or new friendships. For those of you unfamiliar, it's a social media app designed primarily for gay men. One day I was scrolling and received a new message from a guy called Brian. I took a look at some of his profile pictures, read his bio and decided that I was interested. We started messaging back and forth and he seemed to be really kind and charismatic, who really knew how to hold a conversation something that's very hard to come by on the app. A few days went by and we eventually exchanged numbers and he seemed nice enough. I wanted to see if he was a greater person as he was over text message, so I asked him if he wanted to go on a date with me, and he very happily agreed. So I scheduled a date with him. The plan was that I was going to first drive to his place, pick him up and grab some lattes at my favourite local coffee shop. It was around 6 in the evening and I was sending him a text message to tell him that I was leaving my house, to which he responded with a quaint, I can't wait to meet you. I smiled at his supposed kindness. Then in the middle of driving to his house, I received a phone conversation that goes like this. Hey Brian, what's up? Hey, quick change of plans. I'm feeling tired and would rather not go out. Would you be okay at staying at my place? We can watch some shows and order takeout. I mean, that's not what I really had in mind. I'd like to go out and do things on the first date. Oh, don't be such a buzzkill, just come over. I won't show you a bad time. As he spoke on the phone, I got a really strange feeling in my gut, like something was wrong about how he spoke to me. Before I met him, I had imagined his voice and inflections to sound a lot more lighthearted because of the way we messaged. It was very whimsical and fun, but over the phone, he spoke like he was in a hurry, perhaps slightly frantic. However, despite my feelings, I decided I would accept his offer. Perhaps he was just tired or stressed from the workday. I pulled into his driveway and he greeted me at his door. He looked like his picture and he was very handsome. He was wearing fashionable glasses and his dark straight hair contrasted with his light skin. When we go inside, I was greeted by one of his roommates who was playing Dark Souls in the living room. I wanted to be polite, so I approached the roommate and introduced myself. I didn't want to come off as rude to Brian in case this date ended up going really well. While I'm talking with his roommate, Brian calls my name and beckons me to walk inside his bedroom. I politely excused myself and followed Brian into his room. When I walked inside, I saw something straight out of no sleep. Only this was right in front of me. There were candles lit all around, and when I got a closer look, I noticed there were several altars scattered across the room. Effigies of ancient looking figures, animal bones, and jars with unidentifiable liquids inside them. Some sort of dagger next to a cat's skull. The whole shebang. I don't remember all the altars, but I remember a couple. One of them was on the floor, and there was a glass container that held some kind of yellow liquid around animal skulls surrounding the container. Another altar was on a shelf next to his bed, and this one had a few candles surrounding some kind of doll with its eyes sewn shut and a hand missing. Now that one was super creepy and bizarre. A part of me was telling me to nope the hell out of there immediately, but I thought that maybe I was overreacting to someone's religious choice. I didn't know much about cult religions, so I didn't want to assume that this guy had any kind of malintent. 
Plus, I can be a little overreactive at times, so I decided that I was just gonna go along for the ride. When we walked into his room, I wanted to calm my nerves. And because I have a really curious mind, I decided to ask Brian about what the altars were for. He told me that he would tell me about them later. A weird response, but okay. I brushed it off, thinking that it might be just a bit eccentric. I can be a little weird too, so I tried to be empathetic and understanding. Then I point to one of the altars and ask about it. He frowns and scowls. Don't touch that. His voice startled me. His intense inflections paired with his angry expression sent a lump straight to my throat and I felt threatened. I was almost four feet away from the altar, not even close to touching it. And yet he yelled at me like a father yelling at his kid to stop messing around the church. I was confused and thinking I had done something wrong. I apologized. In the blink of an eye, his scowl turned to a smile and he kindly invited me to sit with him to watch a show. What really weirded me out was the fact that his smile kind of felt genuine. He had gotten angry, but all of a sudden he didn't care and served me up a really kind disposition. I was unsure how to process with everything that has just happened. So I decided to sit down with him. He seemed to be acting pretty normal once this ordeal had happened. And we started to talk about ourselves. After some time, he became really sweet and soft spoken, similar to how we were over messages. And we were able to share some stories about our lives. It was starting to feel like it was an actual date. And my nerves subsided a bit. And I was probably just overthinking everything. He then turns on his TV. Now, mind you, I was still a little freaked out by his random outbursts, so I was on guard. So I offered to invite his roommate to come and hang out with us. Brian's roommate seemed like an old average Joe when I met him, and I just wanted someone else to be there to act like a buffer. I wanted to see how he would act around other people. But when I gave him my idea, he immediately shuts me down and his personality switched from easygoing to stressed and angry. He started cussing out his roommate to join me, making it clear that he absolutely hated him. The switch was jarring. I also started to panic. Then he changed the subject and began to talk about me. He said that he found me really attractive and in the process, his fingers started to graze my thigh. I needed a second to collect myself though. So I excused myself to get some water. When I stood up, he immediately slapped my butt and told me not to take too long. I walked out, closed the door behind me and started to make my way for the kitchen. I was hoping to chat with his roommate to see if I could ask him about Brian, but he was asleep on the living room couch. So I made a beeline to the cabinets and searched for a cup. I thought about walking out and driving home because I didn't appreciate his sudden touchiness, but I started getting paranoid. He had all those altars and he didn't tell me what the altars were for. I've seen some horror films about the occult and I truly had no idea what this guy was capable of. Yes, he was sweet at times, but he was showing me some really aggressive behavior. Who's to say that this guy isn't able to put some kind of voodoo curse on me. Dramatic, I know, but you can never really be sure. So I grab my water and cautiously head back to his room. So when I walk back inside, I saw him sitting on the couch with his legs crisscrossed and his eyes closed. When I approached him, I saw his mouth moving, but didn't hear anything coming from it. Weirded out, I called his name, but he didn't respond. Strange. I called his name a second time and he opened his eyes, uncrossed his legs and went back to watching TV without at all addressing what he was doing. What the hell? I was getting really worried. But I did what I could to keep my cool. I didn't want to do anything to upset him or make him lose his cool. I sat next to him on the couch and we started talking. Once again, he was completely normal, unnervingly normal. It's like I was in the same room with a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, except Brian was able to switch between the two seamlessly. I needed to do something. But what the hell was I supposed to do? I couldn't call him out because he might lash out in some way. But I also didn't want to stay because he was freaking me the hell out. I just stay 
and I try to devise some kind of plan to get out of there without making him angry. At some point he gets up to grab his phone, and I thought I would try to dish out the same thing he did to me when I went to get water. Maybe it would release the tension that I was feeling. Maybe he'd like it, and I'd make him less aggressive. But regardless, I wanted to try something. I made my move and gave his butt a cheeky grab. Immediately, he turned around, swatted my hand away and lunged at me. He had his hand curled up in a fist and he flung it towards my face. His fist was inches away from making a connection with my right cheek, but he stopped mid punch. In that moment, I saw that his eyes were wide open and his facial expression was cold and emotionless. He was right in my face. My heart was beating so fast that I felt like I was seconds away from an aneurysm. He was looking directly at me and my eyes started back. At that moment, I felt like the prey to his predator. Then he uncurled his fist, put his icy hand on both sides of my face and started to squeeze. You're so cute. He pulled me in and forced a kiss, and I absolutely did not want to kiss him. But I was paralyzed and couldn't will myself to push him away. His words were patronizing, sort of like he was talking to a dog. And it felt even more like this because he had just scrunched my face against his. I felt disgusted kissing someone who had almost punched me in the face, but there was nothing I could do in that moment. I didn't want to risk annoying him. He slowly pulled away, giving me another sweet smile and sat down pretending that nothing had happened. Just started staring at the TV. I was over this completely. His behavior was becoming more erratic and more unpredictable. His room was creepy as hell and he clearly had associations with the occult and frankly, he was scaring me. I eventually decided that I just would rather deal with the voodoo looking altars later than stay in his house and have to put up with the immediate danger. So I snapped myself out of the anxiety induced trance, stood up and told him that I was starting to get sick and that I wanted to go home. He got angry and tried to convince me to stay the night, but I gathered my courage and insisted that it was time for me to go. He begrudgingly let me leave, but it was clear that my decision pissed him off, but I didn't care anymore. I said my goodbyes and told him that I'd messaged him later. No way, I thought to myself. I got in my car and drove home shaking and sweating. I felt relieved to get out of there, but nervous that he might try to do something. The uncertainty of it all is what truly shakes me up. But thankfully, no actual harm came to me. Who knows what could have happened if I'd have stayed though. I blocked Brian's number as well as his grinder profile. And even now I keep my own grinder pictures private. I haven't heard from him since, but I still fear that he's going to try and come after me somehow. This happened back when I used to get on Grindr, but it always reminds me of how glad I am that I'm no longer doing the online dating thing. For those unfamiliar with Grindr, it's a gay dating app that shows guys nearby. It makes you use your location while using the app, but it doesn't give your exact location unless you send it to the person directly. Anyway, I got a message from a blank profile, no name, no pic, and no bio. The only thing that popped up was how close he was, less than a mile. This happens a lot because there are a lot of closeted guys out there, especially back then. Being an overweight guy in the gay community, I had to take anything I could get because most gay guys in my community wouldn't even give me the time of day. He started off nice enough, introduced himself as Jesus and asked how I was doing and all of that sort of small talk. He told me he was into chubbier guys, and after exchanging pics, we both agreed that we found one another attractive. He asked me if I'd like to come over to play video games and maybe have some, quote, fun. I'd only met a couple of guys off Grinder, and although we had some good times, it ultimately didn't pan out. However, I had met them somewhere public first, so I had never met anyone at their place or had anyone come over to mine. I figured it had been long enough and some casual fun might be nice. Plus, he was really cute and actually my type. 
he agrees to come pick me up since I'm only a few blocks away. Apparently, he lived in the nearby trailer park. I decided I'd like to shower first and he says he'll head over. Then, he says he's really embarrassed to ask but wonders if I'd be willing to lend him $20. Supposedly, he lives with his mum and she had left for the weekend without any food money for him. I know it was really stupid in hindsight, but I felt really bad for him. I tell him I don't have any cash, but he says that's okay. I can just send him some money through an app. I don't remember what it was called, but it was something like Venmo. I go ahead and send it, take my shower, and then let him know I'm ready. He says he's heading out, but can't find his keys. I said it's okay, I'll just wait outside for him. I hadn't given him my address yet, but I was almost ready to. However, when I asked if he had found them, he never responded. Minutes went by, then an hour. I messaged him again to ask if he was still coming, and I could see him going on and offline, so I know he read my messages. I finally just accepted he was ghosting me and probably just wanted money. I messaged him one last time and told him that it was pretty messed up as well as explains that had he just asked, I would have given him the money without having to go through all of that. What can I say? I can be a softy sometimes. Fast forward a couple of weeks. I never heard back from him so I just blocked him. I get another message from someone on Grindr relatively close to me. His profile is also blank which raises my suspicions. He tells me he's also into chubbier guys, which really makes me suspicious because it's highly unlikely two chubby chasers lift so close to me. We trade pics again and it's a different guy. However, he suddenly asks for money again. In Grindr, you can create as many accounts as you'd like. All you need is an email address. There were tons of spam accounts on there that are automated. It was a real pain. Anyways, I called him out because I was like 95% sure it was Jesus. At first, he acts like he doesn't know what I'm talking about, calls me crazy, then blocks me. I felt a little bad because I thought maybe I had made a mistake and just chased off a guy for nothing. Then again, his sudden offensive reaction made me have doubts. Now to the let's not meet part. Weeks go by and every so often this guy tries to fool me even though I don't fall for it. Eventually, I blow up on him and ask him what the hell his problem is. We start going at it and eventually he says, you won't say anything to my face. I tell him that I would gladly tell him to screw off in person. Not that I expected him to actually show up this time. He responded with, all right, we'll see about that. Be there soon. Now, I was a little worried at this point because it crossed my mind that he may not actually be gay and might be some homophobe looking to bash some gay guys. My mind always goes back to those men who have been murdered after meeting up with someone on Grindr. However, I realize I never gave him my address. So I say, nice try, but I never gave you my address. He goes, yes, you did, stupid. You just didn't know it was me be ready, I'm on my way. At this point, my anxiety starts setting off because I did give my address to a guy who had to cancel last minute, but I didn't think anything of it because it was before this Jesus guy had messaged me a second time. I try to think about what to do, so I decide to try and document his threats. I say, I know I didn't give you my address. Besides, what do you want with me anyway? He replies, you'll see. I've got something for you. Now, the trailer park is always having police go by there, and my neighborhood is separated from theirs by a bayou. At night, I always heard gunshots out there, so I began to panic. What if he had a gun? What if he brought his friends with him? I say, oh yeah, and what's that? He replies, something that'll shut you up. I'm outside. I started freaking out because I couldn't tell if he was just trying to mess with me or if he was really outside. I had been screenshotting everything and sent it to the grinder admins to report him for credible threats of violence. I wasn't sure if I should call the cops or not, 
because if he was lying, I didn't want to look stupid. Plus, I wasn't sure if it was even enough for them to do anything. I decided to peek outside from my upstairs window and see if I could spot him. If I could get the make and model of his car, maybe I could at least have something to give the cops. I live in the middle of a cul-de-sac, so when I look out the window, I can see all the way to the end of the street. When I looked out, I saw a car I'd never seen before, parked on the side of the road at the end. My heart was pounding because I just knew it was him, but a part of me was hoping it wasn't. I decided I'd test him and see if he was really out there. He messaged, I'm waiting. I said, I'm outside already, where are you? Of course I wasn't, but if that was him and he did know my address, then why wouldn't he just park outside my house? Sure enough, I was right. He said, yeah, I see you. You're gonna get it now. I replied, then give it to me, I'm right here. He said, just you wait. I knew he couldn't see me from his car because I was peeking out discreetly and our windows have a privacy shade on them where people can only see a black screen from the outside. A few more minutes go by and the car takes off. I have a feeling that he used Grinder to triangulate the area where my neighborhood was, but of course he couldn't find my exact house because it hadn't been him who I'd given my address to. Grinder later sent me a message saying he'd been banned from the app and they had contacted the authorities. I never heard anything else after that, so I don't know what became of it. The cops never contacted me if they did pay him a visit, and I never heard from him again. Now, I'm married, so I don't use Grinder anymore, thankfully. Still, it took a while before I was able to sleep soundly after that. I rarely left the house, and when I did, I always made sure his car wasn't around anywhere. In hindsight, he was probably just a stupid kid wanting to troll people. Still, creepy grinder guy. Let's not meet. Let me start off by saying that I'm a single gay guy. So naturally I use apps like Grinder and Growler. Well one night I got a message on Grinder from a guy called B-Boy, saying how he sees me all the time, which was kind of creepy to begin with since the profile picture was just a tongue sticking out and no noticeable features. Two days later, I got another message asking if I smoked the green stuff, to which I replied, sometimes, and he invited me over to his apartment in our complex to smoke, to which I accepted. Everything started off innocent enough, conversation, smoking, though he seemed like he was already high before I got there, judging by how he was giggling at everything I said. And as the night goes on, he tells me that I need to take the green stuff because it was mine, that I told him to buy it for me, which I didn't, and argued the fact that he offered, that no mention of buying ever occurred, so just shut him down and told him that I would give him 40 bucks the next day after work. Later that night after I left, he proceeds to message me that I need to give him the money or he's going to bring it over, or to my job. Again, I told him I'd bring it over in the 40 the next day, and this continued several times the next day while I was at work, and by now he's getting on my nerves. Meanwhile, I tell him that I can't have the green, nor do I want it, and to just give it to someone else. So after work, I get the money he's asking for. He tells me that I have to help him pay for his traffic ticket that he got because he went to give me the green and got pulled over for not using a signal. So now he's telling me I have to give him $160 because he can't have a ticket because he's trying to get custody of his kids, which looking on it, I doubt was even a factor. So I get another 140 to give him, but now the traffic ticket has gone up to 200 which sends up red flags and I told him I couldn't or wouldn't pay for it. To be perfectly clear, I'm not giving him money to help him out, but out of self-defense to get him away from me, since I didn't know what to expect just in case he was dangerous. I had to backpedal my steps and tell him I lied about where I lived and worked just so that he wouldn't get them involved. 
but truthfully I was just glad I never gave him my name or got his. So he didn't have much to go on besides my physical description. I was afraid that he would go looking in our apartment building asking for me, which is exactly what happened. I quickly hid in the bedroom closet while my roommate answered the door and told him they hadn't seen who he was looking for. I quickly called my boss and told him in a very condensed version what had happened and told him if someone comes looking for me who doesn't know my name, just what I look like, that I don't work there and that they don't know me. Then I get a barrage of messages asking if I have his cell phone from at least five different phone numbers, so I know they're all him, which is even more suspicious. I didn't reply to any of these, so eventually they stopped, but now I'm scared to leave the apartment except for work because of that pushy stalker. Let's not meet again. This happened to me about six or seven years ago. I've never told this story before. I was about 15. I was not a popular kid, and whilst I had three or four good friends, I largely tended to keep to myself. I was always obviously gay, and it seemed that the other kids knew this about me far before I did. At this age, as far as I knew, I was straight. I apologize with starting off with something that ought to be a non-factor in this day and age, but this becomes relevant later on. School finishes ludicrously early for us, and our day was done at 2.30pm. Oh, to be young again. This meant that my friends and I would often walk home together. I lived about a 45 minute walk from the school, but it usually took us longer. My house was the furthest away from the school, which meant I would usually do the last 15 minutes or so of the journey alone. On Fridays, I routinely stayed behind after the bell. Art was my favorite subject, and my teacher would always stay until around 5 o'clock planning lessons, marking work, etc. So I was always welcome to hang around in her classroom and work on my art projects. In the winter months, this extra two and a half hours made the walk home a lot colder and gloomier and by the time I would get home, it would usually be dark. None of my other friends stayed behind on Fridays, so I would always have to walk home on my own. I grew up all my life in the town, and walking home alone was no biggie. I knew my way around like the back of my hand, and most of the journey was doable along the main road. It was pretty safe. I had been walking for about 30 minutes when I first saw the man in the burgundy car. I had stopped at a crossing to let a car out onto the main road, and the burgundy car was immediately behind it. However, whilst the car in front had behaved normally, there was something odd about the burgundy car. It slowed down considerably, even though nothing was coming, until eventually it stopped. After a couple of seconds, it pulled out onto the main road quite quickly and drove off into the direction it was heading. At this point, I didn't really pay much attention to the driver. I just knew that it was cold, slightly drizzling, and this indecisiveness was slowing me down. There was an Indian restaurant on the corner about 10 minutes from my house, with a main four-way crossing beside it, with traffic lights, etc. As I was approaching the restaurant, I realized the burgundy car was stopped at the traffic lights, now facing towards me. The lights changed and it pulled up beside me. He wound down his window and said, Hello. I stopped and said hi back. He asked if I knew where a certain school was. He was very, very polite and well-spoken, quite pale, overweight, but friendly looking. He had glasses perched at the end of his nose and very thin, auburny hair that was slicked back. I would place him in his 50s or 60s. I did know where the school was because it was my school. I was even wearing my uniform. There were only three schools in the area, each with different uniforms. Yes, I explained to him that I went to the school and that if he followed the main road along the high street and took a left, he would easily find it. He thanked me and I soon realized something wasn't quite right because he didn't seem to be driving off. 
He was just looking at me. You have a very familiar face, he said. Perhaps I know your dad. In hindsight, I definitely made a mistake in giving my name, but my dad was quite well known in the town, and I figured it was likely that he was a friend of his. My father and I look very alike. I gave him our surname, which was super uncommon, but he wasn't able to identify any of my family members. Then he said something which I still hear so clearly in my mind. It's David, isn't it? I remember being frozen for seconds. Yes, I said finally. Yes, I thought so. I could never forget such a handsome face. I should note that I didn't really feel threatened by the man. At the time, I thought that we must have had some mutual connections, since he had already referenced my dad, and our town was pretty small. I was a pretty awkward kid, and I was used to situations where family friends would say, I haven't seen you for so long, and I'd have to pretend I knew who they were. So I pretty much thought that this was another of those moments. Ah, I think I know now, he said. Do I know you from one of the apps? I didn't use any apps, as my phone was an old Sony Ericsson model. Is it Grinder? he asked. I told him no, I'd never heard of that. It was at that point that I really got alarm bells, because it became obvious that I didn't know this man at all. I'm on a few forums, I said, and explained that I don't have my picture on the internet, so he wouldn't have seen me online. I didn't even have Facebook at the time. I remember him looking a mixture of disappointed and frustrated as he finally broke eye contact with me and looked off down the road. So the school's that way? He asked, and I said yes. Do you think you could show me and I'll give you a lift home? He asked. Now I was panicking. I might have been naive for most of the encounter, but this was more than enough for me to realize that I had to get away. No, sorry, I said. I'm really late home. It's literally just straight down and then turn left. He gave me a look that I'll never forget, tutted and drove off at speed. I made the rest of the walk home quicker than I'd ever done before, constantly looking over my shoulder. I was paranoid that he might follow me. I didn't mention anything to mum when I got home. The whole ordeal had only taken a minute or so but I went straight onto my computer and googled Grinder app, curious as to where the man had thought he had seen me. Naturally, I discovered Grinder and felt sick to my stomach at the implication of what I read. Now, obviously, I had been very lucky in that no harm had come to me, but I spent a long time scared that I would encounter the man in the burgundy car again, so much so that I stopped going to my extra art sessions and refused to walk home alone. Even today, I can't bring myself to download Grindr or use similar gay apps, which puts me at quite a disadvantage where my love life is concerned. And even though I've long since left the town and moved to a big city, I still sometimes find myself doing a double take when I spot a burgundy car. I think a lot of the reason it still haunts me from time to time is that there were so many unanswered questions. How did he know my name? Did he really recognize me? Or was that just a lure? Had he actually seen a profile for me on an app like Grindr? And if so, how had it gotten there? All I know is that the more I think about that encounter, the more sinister it seems to me. So, man in the burgundy car, let's not meet.